A prerequisite for the market revolution was an improved transportation network. During the colonial period, roads were built and maintained by local and county government. The condition of New Jersey's roads in the 1790s was notoriously bad. Whoever travels the road from Stony Brook Steep to Rocky Hill in a wheel carriage does it at the hazard of his life. If the surgeons of Princeton object to having the roads mended, for fear travelers will have no bones broken, they ought to get their bones broken. The New Jersey legislature decided that rather than spending public funds to construct turnpikes and bridges, it would authorize private companies to do the job. To ensure that these privately financed internal improvements would be profitable, the charters prohibited other roads or bridges from being built in the general vicinity. The exclusive grants to build turnpikes and bridges established the precedent that was invoked to promote the steamboat and the railroad in the early 19th century. Whether the state or private company should fund internal improvements was one of the most controversial issues during the 1820s. Inspired by the success of the Erie Canal in New York State, in 1824, the New Jersey legislature chartered a private company to build the Morris Canal across northern New Jersey. Completed in 1831, the canal was an engineering wonder. It captured the attention of European travelers like Mrs. Frances Trump. We spent a delightful day in New Jersey visiting the inclined planes, which are used instead of locks on the Morris Canal. This is a very interesting work. It is one among a thousand which proved the people of America to be the most enterprising in the world. There is no point in the national character of the Americans which commands so much respect as the boldness and energy with which public works are undertaken and carried through. Nothing stops them if a profitable result can be fairly hoped for. The Jacksonian Democrats wanted the state to build a canal across central New Jersey. This plan was opposed both by the backers of the Morris Canal as well as by John Stevens and his sons, who had shifted their attention from running steamboats to building a railroad between Camden and South Amboy. Finally, Governor Peter Vroom suggested a compromise. Vroom urged the legislature to authorize the construction of both a railroad and a canal. The legislature chose to charter two private companies to build the projects. On February 4, 1830, the same day the legislature granted the charter to the Camden and Amboy Railroad, it also approved the charter for the Delaware and Raritan Canal. As an omen, it took 10 minutes to sell out the railroad stock. On the other hand, it took a full year to dispose of the canal stock. One of John Stevens' sons, Robert Livingston Stevens, became president of the Camden and Amboy Railroad. Robert promptly departed for Britain to order an engine from an English ironworks. The John Bull, as the locomotive was named, was sent to America in parts and was assembled by a Camden and Amboy mechanic named Isaac Drips. Meanwhile, Commodore Robert F. Stockton of Princeton became the president of the DNR Canal Company. Realizing that the canal could not compete with the railroad, Stockton proposed a merger of two companies. The merger brought into existence the so-called joint companies. The president of the new company was Robert Stockton. Second in command was Edwin Stevens, another of John Stevens' sons. In 1832, the state legislature prohibited the construction of any railroad between New York and Philadelphia without the consent of the joint companies. In return for this de facto monopoly, the joint companies paid New Jersey a so-called transit duty, which provided 70% 
of the state's revenue prior to the Civil War. The local offices of the joint companies were in apartment 10 of Snowden's Hotel, later known as the Trenton House Hotel. From this apartment, the joint companies dispensed railroad passes and other favors to state legislatures and other office holders.